Every life has a story, and every story is worth sharing. Your story, my story, and our story speak of victory and defeat, joy and sorrow, resilience and vulnerability. They are not just our story, they are Christ's story in us. They are Kingdom Stories from Down Under. I was blessed to meet tonight's guest um, at uh, Church and Christian Fellowship, where, where I served for a number of years. And we created a beautiful bond mm. uh, in the Lord. Yes, Lord. And this bond has taken us into uh, a great, a great journey together. Yes, he has helped me so much along the path. A lot of wisdom here. He's like a spiritual dad to me. And it's just wonderful to have people like Merv in my life. Tonight, I'm so privileged and I've waited for almost a year and a half to have him here. Merv Walsh, welcome Merv. Thank you, Nathaniel. Just, just as we head off, I just want to thank you. You've been such an amazing support to me and in establishing the ministry in the last sort of, I think it's about six or seven years yeah. now. And uh, it is 2015, seven yep. years now. Um, just the confidence yeah. that you gave me and the fact yeah. that you believed in us yeah. is absolutely magnificent. Yeah. Uh, you're a true confidant and uh, I'm blessed to have you. Well, I think I'm blessed to have you as a friend too, Nathaniel. I really mean that. And I'm always amazed by the things that you do to further God's kingdom. I really, really mean that. I'm just amazed at what you do. Praise God. Yeah, no, it's just you know, your story. You, know, you need to write a book about it. <laughs> Thanks for that. I'll I'll take that on. No, you do. I keep telling a lot of people that they need to write a book. You know, like you know Spencer Spencer, the associate pastor at Global Heart, um, not the associate pastor, pastoral director, I should say. He needs to write a book too for his story, just like Paul wrote his book. You yeah. know, his story, and it's just just amazing. I was telling us some funny stories about. Uh, I won't uh, tell you about them, but uh, he told us a couple of funny stories that he did when he was at school and a bit of a tearaway on the weekend. That was quite 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 amazing. You get the podcast, listen to it. Wonderful. Yeah, it really was. So where's your book? Uh, my book. <laughs> my book's, uh, I take photographs. All right. That's so my book. your book is tonight here. Yeah, that's right. Your stories. Yeah. Where did, where, where did your story begin? In England? No, my, no, 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 no. Sorry. I'm a Queenslander. You're a Queenslander. Yes, your wife I'm, is English, though. Yeah, Helen's English. But that's a different story. Yes. Um, <laughs> I was born in Townsville on the 24th of October, 1948. And when my father registered the birth, he registered me as the 27th. Oh. I didn't find that out till I went to get my driver's license. I so you're I'd, a day older? Uh, three days. Oh, three days. Yeah. Three days younger. 24, 27. Oh, okay. Three days younger. But yeah, I, anyway, uh, cut a long story short, my mum and dad were uh, working class people. They um, were in Townsville at the time. Then they moved to Brisbane for a little while. Then they moved up to Cairns in North Queensland. And we moved there and we had a place in uh, West Cairns. And in my family, there were seven boys and two girls. Wow. And I was number six. Wonderful. And uh, I think there's Alan, Linda, and uh, Stephen are all passed away. Uh, Alan passed away a few years ago. Uh, Linda passed away in a car accident. My brother Stephen, uh, he passed away. He was, um, he'd been smoking and drinking all his life, and he passed away from that. That's a, that's a, I'll come back to that because that's a miracle in itself. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we, we uh, were in a small two bedroom house with a big sleep out in Cairns that dad built. Um, he was, dad was a carpenter and mum was a stay at home mum, you can imagine, with a, nine, you know, kids. nine kids. And uh, one of the things that the family always told us was that whatever you do, try and get a trade or something you can go back to. So my brother Neville's the oldest, he was a motor mechanic. Uh, Alan was a panel beater, Dennis was a plumber, Colin was a cabinet maker. Russell didn't get a trade, but he was a truck driver, can drive anything. Yeah, and that is a trade. Yeah, in a sense. and I, uh, in a long way around, I became a fitter and turner. Oh. And uh, my uh, sister, Linda, she didn't qualify in anything. And my brother, Stephen, he didn't qualify in anything. My sister, uh, Cheryl, uh, didn't, didn't get any sort of a qualification. But, uh, yeah, and we lived in Cairns and we used to go sailing every Sunday at, in the Cairns Harbour, which was brilliant. On oh, no, a right. small, small yeah, thingy. Kind yeah, of seven a... foot eleven boats. It was called. They were called sabbat, sabbats. And you hired those, or you no, we owned them. Oh you no, one? dad, dad built a couple of them. My dad oh, nice. was a um, very, very good carpenter. Yes. And uh, was Even a boat builder. Yeah, yeah, good. And it was made out of the uh, marine plywood. He used to bend them, mm -hmm. bend them over the holes and everything. And he, we had a, um, a seven foot eleven boat called uh, Little Sabbat, and we had a trainee. 
And uh, when we could, we used to go out and uh, when we were older, you had to start at eight and at 15 you had to move up higher. Mm -hmm. And uh, we never used to wear life jackets or anything like that. It was just not done in those days. And uh, Not even uh, sunscreen? No, 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 not even sunscreen. Oh, coconut oil. Come on, <laughs> we had to cook ourselves. It's the other way around. Yeah, it was. <laughs> I mean, that carried through to all the lifesavers and everything that, that I went into. We never used to put zinc on our nose, but sun, uh, uh, coconut oil on our body to cook us. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, we sailed in cans for a long time. And then, unfortunately, my dad was a um, – he could rig a boat, he could make a boat, but he hated the water. But all my brothers, uh, my mother's side of the family were from uh, Sweden mm -hmm. and uh, they were all, all my uncles on that side of the family were merchant captains okay. in, uh, going, uh, seagoing. So I think that's where we got it from. The Vikings. Uh, yes, that's true. I've got a uh, problem with my hand here. That's a Scandinavian disease. That uh, it, <laughs> yeah, uh, over, over, a lot, over a period of time, your hand can go, go like that. Okay. And that I reckon that's from using the uh, Viking axes and all that. So who knows? <laughs> <laughs> That's just my, my theory. Your take on it. It's a good day. Yeah. But my father uh, started gambling and drinking uh, when I was in the, probably about uh, year eight or probably nine. Probably the other way around, drinking and gambling. <laughs> well, both of, both, both of them. And uh, unfortunately, he was on, you know, in those days in the 60s, he was on £25 a week and uh, he used to have to give mum money for our uh, food and, and, and that. And dad used to take care of all the other bills. And unfortunately, he uh, started gambling. And uh, when I had just finished, uh, what was it, year 10, uh, that the bank foreclosed on our house. Oh. So in Cairns, so all of my brothers had left. There was only myself and my uh, younger uh, siblings there. And we moved down to Tully, which is about oh, 100 miles or so south of, uh, uh, no, oh, south Cairns. of Cairns on the way to Townsville. Mm -hmm. And Dad had a contract there as a carpenter to put, help build a, a local school. Yep. So we stayed there for a while and that changed everything because at the time I was going to go on from year 10 and do what was called, like nowadays, like we call it senior nowadays, is get you, you're leaving. And uh, my family just couldn't afford it. So that's where I became a fitter and turner. I went to the Tully Sugar Mill mm -hmm. and I became a fitter and turner there, a five-year apprenticeship. Yep. And uh, then about nine months after I started, my mum and dad uh, moved to Townsville. So oh. I was left in in um, Tully for a while, uh, living in the barracks. And then uh, when they could, they arranged a transfer me to go to a company called Evans Deacons in Townsville, yes. which was a marine sort of a, a refurbishment company. And um, I went down there and I stayed home. Then my mum and dad again decided to move to Brisbane. Oh. So I was left in Townsville. How, uh, how was your mum handling all these? Uh, she was okay. She, you know, she seemed to be okay, okay with it all. You know, she believed that the family stayed together. Yeah. At that stage, anyway, I should say. Because um, it would have taken a toll on her. Yeah. Well, I think having nine kids took a big toll on her. Yeah. You know, and you see the mountain of our washing each week. You know, it was, and it was bearing in mind those days was uh, my brothers used to be, and when they were working uh, for motor dealers, they had to wear white overalls. Oh. So we used to have to uh, boil them each week and put. Um, uh, blue starch in them, so they were starch and everything to go. It was just stupid, you know. Yeah. And uh, But anyway, uh, they went to Brisbane and I, at that time I'd met a couple of guys in Townsville and one of my very good mates, uh, Neville O'Sullivan, his mother had had 12 children mm. and uh, Neville was the youngest and he was a fitter and turner at the copper refineries in Townsville. Yep. And we were doing our take colleges together and uh, he, he spoke to his mum and I spent the last three and a half years at their place in Townsville. Hmm. And uh, I finished my apprenticeship in uh, Townsville. As a fitter and turner? Yeah, fitter and turner. Yeah, five year apprenticeship. Yeah. And five I, years? Yeah. These days it's only three, but it's yeah. five years. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, you do four years of take college and one year just on the job. But I then transferred from Evans Deacons out to the copper refineries to be with uh, you know, my mate no, Neville O'Sullivan and that. And out there, they were part of the Mount Isa Mines Group and they had a wonderful system for teaching, trade, uh, teaching apprentices. Yeah. And in your third year to fourth year, you were basically regarded as a tradesman, just sent out on jobs to do, and that was it. And uh, we, um, Mrs. O'Sullivan was a very staunch Catholic, as you imagine, with 12 kids. And um, she. Were your parents also Catholic? Um, my dad was born as Catholic. Uh, you know, like, sorry, not born Catholic. He, he was. Uh, raised. His parents were raised as, as uh, raised him as a Catholic. But when, my, when he married my mum, she was Church of England, so he changed over to Church of England. And that's one of the things that um, my family used to do. On Sunday, we had to go to Sunday school up the road and uh, the uh, priest had come around to talk to Dad and he'd just yeah. put the hose across the path. He wouldn't let him on the site. 
But um, he, uh, we used to go to Sunday school, but it was meaningless. It really was. It was mean. It didn't mean anything to us. We were forced to go. Yeah. And I was, that's what I was getting to with uh, the O'Sullivans. They used to go to mass all the time. I never. The only time I used to go was on um, Christmas and Easter. Yes. And we'd go to midnight mass on Christmas Eve, and then you'd go back to the O'Sullivans' place to have a big party at their place till two or three in the morning. So it just it didn't mean anything. Yes. It really didn't mean anything. And finished my apprenticeship, and the copper refineries had a policy that you had to go away from them, and uh, you know, wouldn't continue on as a trade. As soon as you finished, you had to go away and get experience. Well, my plans were that I was going to go um, and join BHP as and try and become a marine and power engineer. Mm -hmm. And and what happened was uh, I went down to Brisbane to visit my folks and spent about a month there. And funnily enough, in those days the Fitter and Turner in Brisbane was getting less money than it was a 50-year apprenticeship in Townsville. And my mates had gone out to Mount Isa. Now, the reason they went out to Mount Isa was there was good money out there in those days, not like you know, nothing like there is today. And what they did was they'd go out there. Neville and Carolyn went out, Neville went out there. He got married and they lived out there for about five years. But when they come back to Townsville, they were able to pay cash for their home. Yeah. And that's what, all, that's what we were doing. Yeah. So I joined them out there as a Fitter and Turner in the engineering workshop. And about seven weeks after I uh, joined them, because I'd been from the copper refineries, they asked me to go and teach apprentices. Mm -hmm. and I was in there for about a month or so while somebody was on leave. And then a couple of months later, they got me to go back in there again. So yep. for the rest of my time there, I just taught apprentices, first and second year apprentices, the trade. Mm -hmm. They had their own training school there. And uh, then in 71, it's the reason I got my passport, old passport out today to look, look up the, uh, the date. In, in the end of 70, my I'd finished my training in 69 yes and i was out in mount isa that was the beginning of 69 mm -hmm. and i was out in mount isa i was nearly there for about two years and um my older brother neville who was over in canada he had he was managing a series of businesses over there yeah and he in he invited they just took over a uh, got, got another company a little engineering company a place called seaforth in ontario and he rang me up one day and took he paid my airfare to go over and uh, uh, he wanted me to come over and look after the engineering shop because he had, didn't have a clue. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I flew down to Sydney. I uh, had a couple of days in Sydney with my family, my, my, my older brothers that were living in Sydney. And then I went from 103 degrees in Mount Isa to about 10 or 15 below in Toronto. <laughs> and uh, I spent the first couple of weeks hanging around air conditioning, you know, heaters, heaters and everything like that in cars. And I learned over there, I, I used to uh, go down to this place. Where, where in Ontario? In Toronto. In Toronto. Toronto. Yeah. Toronto. I used to live on, uh, on um, I used to live in St. Jamestown, and this was one big square, had 26,000 apartments on this one block. Wow. And uh, we were on about the 19th floor or something. It was about another 10 or 12 floors above us. But then we moved down closer to uh, the offices, and the offices were downtown uh, Toronto. But I used to, the places we looked after was a, there was a marina up at um, Big Rito Lakes near on the way to Ottawa. Yes. There was a supermarket in, um, I think it's Oshawa, outside of Toronto. There was a, a, a butcher shop in Hamilton. Uh, there was a, a food uh, delivery place that uh, delivered supplies to um, people like Hungry Jacks in, uh, I can't think of the name of the place now, but then there was an engineering place in Seaforth and a woodworking place in Stratford. Now, Stratford was about 30 miles from Seaforth. And I had to look after both of them. And Stratford, what they did was made the uh, wooden harness racing yes. frames and mm -hmm. sold them down in America. And so I, I had a uh, 383 cubic inch uh, Dodge Plymouth V8 over there. and I As you do. Oh, as you do. And I get about eight miles to the gallon. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the speed limit 70 mile an hour. Of course, nobody abided by it. Um, I used to travel down to Stratford and Seaforth about two, you know, like every week down there. And on Saturdays, I'd drive down to uh, the place that did all the uh, distribution to the food, you know, to play, people like Hungry Jacks, then back to Hamilton and bring the banking back so it would be banked in the office on Monday. And that was my, my, my we, Saturdays, yeah. And then uh, we stayed over there for about 15 months. That's why I looked it up today because I was, I was a bit sure, unsure. I, I always thought it was longer than that. And then my uh, older brother, Neville, decided to come back to Australia. And my brother, Colin, who was over there as well, Colin was a, um, he was a cabinet maker. I, be, I lived with Colin when I was over there, became very good friends. 
and uh, we, my brother Neville had a Mooney M20C, which was a, like a Beechcraft Bonanza. And we, I flew down to a place in Hartford, Connecticut, and saw a guy named Walt Moody. He was a specialist at ferrying planes all over the world. So um, I flew down and saw him and arranged for the plane, plane to be taken down there, and he flew it from Hartford, Connecticut to Shannon Island, a single-engine hmm. aircraft with a long-range fuel tanks in the back seat, and he got over there okay. And uh, we flew. I um, so you took your, your private license. I, I never got a private license. My brother Colin did. Okay. I, I could fly a plane, but he had to. He was yeah. he was a pilot. Um, and we we flew to England and uh, flew from uh, into single the, engine plane. No, we we flew commercially. Oh, okay. Colin, uh, this uh, Walt Moody, flew it to Shannon and Ireland. He come back commercially and uh, left the plane in Shannon and Ireland, and we flew commercial jet to London, from London to, to uh, Shannon and Ireland and to pick the plane up. And uh, we flew from Shannon and Ireland uh, across Ireland to Dublin and we followed... So the... where did he stop? Iceland and... Well, he, no, he flew non-stop. Whoa. This guy had flown, I think he held a record at some stage, he'd flown from... He was going to Norway and he flew across the... Um, uh, to over, over Ireland and he got to, to England and there was a good tar when there had plenty of fuel, so he flew onto Norway, single engine, non-stop. Yeah. Must have been freezing up there. Don't know. I wasn't with him. No. <laughs> but anyway, we, we picked up the plane, flew in it Ireland. in Ireland. We followed all the uh, roads. We had road maps going to Dublin. And we flew across the Irish Sea to Liverpool. And from Liverpool, we flew down to a place called Stoford Tawney, just north of London. And there we had what was called a UHF radio put in. So we were going to fly it from London to uh, Sydney. Yeah. How old were you? Uh, 22 or 23? 20, I was born 48, it was 71, 72 it was. So that's at uh, 24. Wow. Yeah, and Colin was uh, Colin You Spivey. were single, obviously. Yeah, of course. I didn't meet, him, didn't meet Helen until Sydney when we come back to Sydney. Uh, but Colin was 29. He had his license. A very good pilot. And we so this was just an adventure for you guys. Well, we're bringing the plane back to Australia, and it was you know just something to do. <laughs> and so we went. The to fuel the, wasn't expensive. The trip wasn't. Oh, uh, well, the the bit, thing is that when you fly from country to country, you get it all tax free. Okay. So there's no taxes on the fuel. Yes. And we just had a, what was called a uh, a carnet card. I think it was called. It was a shell card that we paid for the fuel. You know, when we when we just when, when they, they told us they wanted a bill, we yeah. paid for it. But we. Um, uh, the plane was fitted. We flew from uh, State for Tawney to uh, Gatwick to clear customs, from Gatwick to Dieppe. And from Dieppe, we flew down to Lyon. And then from Lyon, we landed in Nice. Because uh, when you're flying a private, I don't know what it's like today, but in those days, you had to give countries notice that you were going to yeah. come in there. So to get into Italy, you had to have given three days' notice in a private aircraft. So you had to wait in Nice. Oh, it was terrible. Oh, I know. It was a horrible Monte place Carlo. to play. Yeah, Monte Carlo. <laughs> went, went, went to casinos there and watched everybody lose their money. I'm not a gambler. I'm not so where a, did you stay in hotels? Just in a uh, yeah, just in a uh, hotel or something like that. It was was quite good. Met a few guys from Australia going around Europe on five dollars a day. Yeah. And they were living. We were living about two or three streets back from the uh, you know the promenade, and they were living about three or four miles inland, and they were still getting around. They didn't they didn't factor in that you know all the travel that they had to do and everything like that. Anyway, we took off from Nice after the three days and get out over the Mediterranean and uh, the engine starts, the engine of the plane starts going brum, brum, and uh, starts missing. <laughs> and single engine aircraft, no spare engine. Yeah. And in planes, they have two lots of spark plugs on, on, the, on each cylinder, yeah. on, you know, on, on two banks of them. And we're supposed to go to a, an, a, an airport just outside of Rome called Urbay. And uh, we dialed them up on the uh, radio and spoke to them, told them we're having problems. They didn't bother answering us. So we did what anybody else would do. We flew down the coast. just Because we figured yeah. we're going to have a go in the water. We're going to land on the, in the water. We flew down to Naples and uh, landed there and told them what was going on. They checked it out and said oh, it was all okay. So we hopped over the, the, the boot of Italy to uh, Brindisi and spent the night in Brindisi. And then we flew from Brindisi across into Athens and we're flying into Athens, and again the engine starts missing over the bay of the, uh, you know, I think it was the bay of Athens. And we got the control towers. They they uh, said, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, we'll 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 slot you in. Come in straight after the jumbo. 
Yeah. We said negative on that because it was, um, uh, and when you're flying, there's a lot of turbulence of those big planes, so we had to wait 10 minutes. Anyway, we landed, we spent the night in Athens, and wherever you go around the world as a private air, you know, in a private aircraft, you're looked after by the local private pilots. So they took us all over Athens and everything. Nice. But the Olympic Airways checked the engine over and they found that the one set of manifolds on one side was not tightened up properly when it was serviced in America. Yeah. And so that was causing the missing. So they tightened all that up. Anyway, the next day we flew on to uh, Nicosia in Cyprus and on the way over, clouds come in and we were supposed to fly at a certain level. We flew below it because, you know, we weren't rated for instruments. And we landed in uh, Nicosia, spent the night there. We went from there to Damascus in Syria. I've got photographs of all this too, by the way. What an adventure. And uh, we were three days in Damascus. Part of the problem was we had to go sort of due west from Damascus to a beacon, about 90 miles out, and uh, then go like a reverse sort of a horseshoe down to, Damas uh, down to Baghdad. And we couldn't pick this beacon up. Yeah. And we had the latest electronic equipment. I remember it was funny. Two funny stories. We go back there and the, one of our engineers pulls the, the, the electronic equipment out and said, oh, look at all these little transistors. And we said, please put it back in again because you've never <laughs> seen it before. And the other time was the uh, military commander wanted to meet us. Now, we're in a light aircraft, thousand, about a four, hour, you know, four or five hour flight each day, no toilets, no nothing. We had water and that. But um, we get up to the control tower and uh, the... Uh, military commander says, have a cup of tea. We thought, tea, boil water, we'll be safe. We get this glass, there's sugar down the bottom, there's yeah. tea leaves and water. We had our cup of tea and put it down. Somebody else poured it out. They'd been around everybody. Oh. So we were a bit worried. <laughs> but anyway, third day we decided, we took off to go to try and find this beacon. In the plane, Colin and I looked at the maps and said, oh, we just fly due west. Don't worry about it. We're not going back. Doesn't matter. We just fly straight across. About 10 or 15 minutes after we crossed this beacon, a MiG come up. Whoa. And another one was over there. We're fortunate it was a Canadian registered aircraft. And they spoke to us in English and said, CFSJU, that was a call sign. We estimate you're 50 miles off course. Uh, please waggle your wings to signify that, you know, you've seen us. So waggle the wings and flaps and everything, you know. Anyway, we went back Who up. Who were on, they? That was the... Uh, the Jordania. No, this, the um, Syrian Air Force. Okay. There was an air base down there that wasn't supposed to be there. Uh, in 72, not long after the wars. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we landed in, in uh, Baghdad and they come out and had a look at the plane and we had a, uh, just an ordinary film SLR camera, shoved it under the seat and uh, we, spent, we didn't spend the night there because we were going to go on to Bahrain and we had to, everywhere you go, you've got to file a flight plan to say yeah. where you're going to go and yep. when you're going to leave and when you estimate a time so they can, if there's any search and rescue. And we're filing the flight plan and it says we're going to go straight down to Bahrain. And uh, the military guy said, you can't go there. I said, what do you mean? You can't go there. It's a new air base down there. Oh. So we had to go big horseshoe, you know, big sort of triangle around it. As we're going down there, we got caught in a dust storm. And I mean a bad yeah. dust storm. We, we couldn't climb over the top of it. So we had to go and land at this place called Basra on the tip of the Persian Gulf. And uh, we landed there. And I'm, we still hadn't eaten. We, so this is all on maps? Yeah. We, on... on Physical yeah, maps yeah, and by compass, yeah, you know, none yeah. of this GPS and anything like that. Um, and we landed in Basra and we hadn't eaten since Cyprus. <laughs> I mean, in, in Damascus, we went in the hotel room, pulled the sheet back and there was long black hairs all down the, the sheets. <laughs> so we threw all that on the floor. We didn't eat. We got to Basra and we ordered some meat and opened it up. It was all green inside. So oh. we didn't eat that. So we get to Bahrain and we check in at Bahrain. And there was a new British Airways only opened it two weeks before, and uh, or the new airport, and there was a, a British cafe there. So we went up and we pigged out on uh, bacon and eggs and fresh milk and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, um, we then stayed at a place called the Obiri Grand Hotel. I always remember that. And down below it was a supermarket. Nice. And uh, we went down there and they were selling the big 825 cans of Australian SPC fruit. So we, bought, we bought 24 cans Just of peaches. Up. Pears, apricots, and whatever, and 48 cans of Heineken <laughs> because we weren't drinking their water. Yes. So we load all that, that on the plane. We flew from Bahrain to Abu Dhabi and we had to rebalance the plane. Then we're flying from Abu Dhabi to go down to Karachi. And you're flying through this mountain pass, as they said, it was supposed to be below 10,000 feet. And we're at 10,000 feet and there's mountains taller than us. 
So, you know, the maps are all, you know, yeah. uh, these days are a lot better with satellite mapping and that. Yeah. But anyway, we're following the race. The, uh, there would have been a, uh, an air race from London to Sydney. We we're following their, their route. We get to this end of the, uh, the uh, of whatever it was, uh, this uh, place. I'm not sure of the name of the place now, but anyway, we're supposed to fly out over the water about 400 miles. We went no way, 90 miles across and down the coast of Iran. We went to Karachi, uh, landed Karachi, spent the night there. Next day, we flew to Ahmedabad. Yeah. And um, again, over the water, the engine was missing, mm -hmm. you know, like this, and we just kept on flying, hoping for the best. We had life rafts and all that on board and life jackets. We went to Ahmedabad, and as we took off from Ahmedabad in India, it was very, very warm in, um, over there. We hit a downdraft, nearly crashed the plane. We went to a place called Nagpur. We spent the night there. India. In India. And we went to the airport and the... Um, you had to go over there. It was a, a hangover of the British. I don't know what it's like today, but you had to go through the army, the customs and the police to get out of the place. Whoa. Every time you went in, went in and out. Anyway, we uh, went through the army. It was okay. Went to the customs. And unbeknown to me, I you know, had to show my passport. We were in this office. And the guy threw a file on my passport inadvertently, and I don't know for sure, but anyway, he put my passport in his, in his file. Then we went through the police. And we went into the hotel, and they said, where's your passport? I went out to the taxi, it was still there. Went out to the airport, couldn't find it anywhere. Went up to the control tower and they allowed us to ring the Australian embassy. So we rang them. They said, I'll oh, just fly up here. And the Australian and the um, military guy said, you can't leave here, you haven't got a passport. Yeah. Well, I was a bit hot-tempered in those days. <laughs> and we had brought a, uh, a shotgun with us, a pump-action shotgun to, um, for protection. Just in case. So if so I'm going out to the plane, I'm going to get that shotgun out, I'm going to stick it up people's noses around until I find my passport. Anyway, they called all the guys out and they found the thing in the guy's office and after that I wouldn't give my passport up. We then flew to Calcutta and we had to wait again three days in Calcutta to go into Burma. And every day, get up in the morning, get a taxi out to the airport, open a can of peaches or pears, eat that, a yeah. couple, of, couple of cans of Heineken and drive back into town again while we were waiting. Didn't do a lot of touring or anything like that, just stayed at the hotel. And we went to Burma and in, we, in, again in Rangoon and Burma, a couple of days we tried to fly down the, the uh, coast, it was the west coast of Thailand, to go to Penang, and every day we hit the monsoons. <laughs> so we couldn't fly in monsoons in the single engine aircraft. So the third day, again, we flew from uh, Rangoon across the bay to a place called Milman. I can remember them as clear as a bell. We landed over there. You lived there. every day in the, in the maximum. Yeah. We landed at this place called Moorman and we said, oh, we're having a bit of trouble with our radio, you know, telling yeah. them a story. We jumped the mountains and landed in Bangkok. Oh. And, well, we're on the other side of the mountains and we weren't getting the, the, the monsoons. Yeah. And then we spent the night in Bangkok and then we flew down to Penang and spent a couple of nights in Penang and we'd had enough then. We got a guy from Sydney to fly up and uh, pick up the plane and bring it back to Sydney. And we boarded a commercial uh, flight and uh, went back to Sydney and my with my brother Colin, it was an amazing adventure. I think we counted up 22 times we nearly got killed. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway. Then, and yeah. then you got married? No, no, not yet. Not yet. That was in, uh, we arrived in May and my brother Colin started a building company and I was working for him and uh, he met a lady called Mariana and she worked at a company called Moronet Fabrics. Mm -hmm. And on the 2nd of September, 1972, uh, I, Helen and I went out on a blind date. And, set up by her. Yeah, set up by brother. her. And it was a, um, to say it was a bit of a schmozzle, that blind date, wasn't it? Went to a restaurant and up in the back of King's Cross called uh, Zorba's and they bought the dessert out the wrong Rick. time and all this sort of stuff. It was just a terrible. It was, you know, and they'd set it up because I'd bought myself an MGB. That I was the last one to pick up Helen and she was, she was, the setup was that I had to drive her, so oh. she would go on, go on anybody else. But anyway, she must have done something right. Uh, we wanted a couple of other dates, and then I took her on a picnic uh, down to was it picnic before the sunburn? Yeah, went to a picnic on the Hawkesbury River because I lived at Dy at uh, Newport Beach, and then at Dy on the northern uh, beaches. We went to this picnic, and I took a lovely salad, a lovely cooked chicken, and a bottle of Matus Rosé. And we'd get out, park the car, and walk down the Hawkesbury. And I'd never researched it, no maps or anything. Yeah. On the way down, the esky broke, <laughs> and the chicken rolled off into the ocean. 
<laughs> so we had a, we sat on this rock. We had a salad and some matus. And on the way back up, Helen had a pair of sco those skull wooden shoes on. The sand got between her under her toes. So you had to carry her. No, no, no. She got back there and she had really bad blisters on her feet. Oh. She had to go to hospital and get them all scraped. That bad. Yeah. She can true dying. Yeah. And yeah. And they still saw me again. It was amazing. And then uh, we went on a date down to uh, Stanwell, down towards Woolardcon, the Stanwell National Park. And we went, went down to this beach. We thought sunscreen on. We put this sunscreen on. Only one trouble, it, was, it wasn't waterproof. Yeah. Uh, and I think we got about third degree burns. Ouch. <laughs> you, just, you just couldn't do well, could you? And, we're, we're, and we, I then uh, popped the question on the 5th of January 1973. We got married on the 7th of April and... Uh, Praise God, on the 7th of April this year, we've been married 49 years. Well done. Congratulations, yeah. both of you. 49 hey. years. That is and she's still with real. me. Uh, My best friend over there. And you, you're still with her? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't, wouldn't have it any other way. So so you're in Sydney? Yeah, in Sydney. and She uh, was in Sydney as well? Yeah, I met her in Sydney. We lived in, we got married and we lived in DY, uh -huh. on DY Parade. And then um, I had a falling out with my family and I just don't want to go into what, what was happening. I had a real falling out with my family. And um, we decided, Helen's mum and dad, when they come to Sydney, they'd been in Perth. And again, the price of land in Sydney out at uh, the back of um, Parramatta, about, it was about 20 kilometres further on from Parramatta or something like that, was $25,000 just for a block without yeah. a house. Yep. And we were not earning any money that we could afford that. Yes. So Helen's mum and dad had been over here. And they told us over here, and we got the West Australian newspapers, you could buy a house and land package at grand. Whitford's Beach Estate, no, for $20,000. Wow. So in um, uh, May 1974, we left Sydney. Was it May? Yeah, it was early May 74. We packed up our our um, Commodore, not our Commodore, our um, Holden Premier station wagon, sent stuff across the uh, Nullarbor. We drove down to, Sydney, uh, to Canberra, then to Melbourne, then to Adelaide, to Port Pirie, and put the car on the train to Port Pirie and got it off at... Uh, Kalgoorlie and drove from Kalgoorlie down to Perth. And you got on the train? At, yeah, at Port Pirie. Yeah, we didn't want, you know, because we had all our stuff in there, all our yeah. valuables or what valuables, our good stuff in the car anyway. Yeah. And uh, we arrived in Perth. Was it, that was common practice across yeah, the world. Yeah, well, at that time, yeah, you put, put it on a train at Port Pirie. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got in Perth and within about two weeks I'd got a job as a... So when you came to Perth, did you know anybody? No. Oh, Helen knew... Mickey and Harry Toombs, I think it was, family friends. And when Helen had come out to Perth in the first time, she'd met a family called the Jacksons. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a lady that Helen was friendly with. There were three sisters, Helen, Sarah and Tessa. And Helen was friendly with Tessa, wasn't it? No, it was Sarah. It was Sarah. And then anyway, we, we knew that uh, Helen was, the older sister, Helen, was training as a nurse. And we met her in uh, Shenton Park. So we knew very little people here in WA when we came over. But you came to settle? Oh, yeah. We came to get a house. And that's what we did. We lived in Maylands in a, a flat that, um, <laughs> believe me, there was bikies in the flat down nice. down below. And when they uh, repaired their car, they, they sorry, their, their motorbike, they took it inside the lounge room. As you do. Yeah, as you do. And when they wanted to clean that, just got the fire hose and just hosed it out. <laughs> uh -oh. it's, it was, I tell you, it's, you know, looking back on all these experiences, Anyway, I got a job as a um, credit officer, then became assistant accountant at a company called Gator Plastics. Mm -hmm. And when I was in Canada, I got exposed to managing a company. And I thought, when I get back to Australia, I'm going to try and do some studies and become a general manager. Yep. And then I read somewhere that to, to do that, you need a really good accounting knowledge. So uh, we bought our house. We moved into a house in 75, but in early 75, at the end of 74, I did a mature age course to get into the then WA Institute of Technology, and I got in, and uh, my number was 752747K, just a matter of interest, my student number. <laughs> and I started a Bachelor of Business degree. Yeah. And uh, was working, that's was at Gaydor Plastics, and I moved to Berger Paints uh, as assistant accountant. And uh, no, I, yeah, I was a financial accountant. My mate Steve Chris was the uh, uh, management accountant, and we were, un we were unqualified, we were both doing our degrees. And uh, I did my six years part time. Yes. Uh, in seventy seven, we had our first daughter, Samantha, and uh, in eighty, we had our second child. And uh, I was working 
five days a week, going to uni three or four nights a week, studying all day Saturday, yeah. and doing my assignments. And I, you know, it was just it was just crazy. We're only talking yeah. about it today. Anyway, uh, in um, 1980, I finished my degree mm -hmm. and uh, got my uh, Bachelor of Business Award in February 81. And in the meantime, I'd been a member of the Society of Accountants as a student member. And I then applied to do the CPA program. But because I'd been working as an accountant part time, and you know, I think it was in 79, that was in 80, sorry, before I'd finished, the finance manager left. So they promoted me to be finance manager at Berger Paints. Nice. Uh, yeah, so because I had experience, I only had to do a day and a half to become a fully, fully qualified CPA. And uh, when I got in there, I never, never thought about general management again. Just yeah. loved the accounting because you had your finger in everything. You saw everything that was going on. And from you there... You had the finger on the pulse. Yeah. There I went to a company called uh, Gadsden's and O'Connor, uh, again, as their financial controller. Went to uh, Joyce Corporation in O'Connor. And Joyce was a, uh, they used to own the Bedshed franchise. They had mm -hmm. uh, Slumber King range of beds and oh, a couple of other different divisions. And I was the financial controller and company secretary. Mm -hmm. And um, about, that was my shortest, one of my shortest careers. I had about 18 months and I left there and went to Swan Cement and I was the uh, financial controller. And well, I, I, was, I was fully qualified. And in that stage, I'd become a fellow of CPA. They, nice. they advanced me to fellow. Um, and then in 92, at, uh, Swan Cement was taken over by a company called Adelaide Brighton and we were promised, uh, the general manager, was uh, my, his job was made redundant on that day and they promised nobody else was going to lose their job and then when I did the budgets and all that sort of stuff, they, uh, they said to me... Yeah, when you have to go. Yeah, I have to go. <laughs> I was an, annoyed for about two or three minutes, then I realised I was better off without them. Yeah. And one of the things I talk about when people say that their job, they've been made redundant. They can never be made redundant mm. because their job can be made redundant. The only one who can make anybody redundant is God, and he won't do that. Or the person yeah. themselves. Yeah, they can't, can't be made redundant. No. Their job is made redundant, yeah. and it's a different way of looking of at things. Yeah, good perspective. Yeah. Anyway, uh, cut a long story short, I was uh, out of work for three weeks, and I went to a look at a, a contract accounting to a gold company in West Perth for a month. That was being wound up and I wound up being there six months and the guy who was the chairman of that company introduced me to Hartley Poynton who had a financial planning division and I was appointed the um, sort of general manager of their compliance and accounting and that. And I spent there for six months and then they, were, then they, um, they decided that they were going to do make all their, all their advisors brokers and there was no room for me because I merged with Hartley Poynton. And again, I was out of work for three months. But funnily enough, the guy who got me the job at Hartley Point, his name was Fran sorry, in West Perth, his name was Francis Way. He was a Christian working for one of the uh, accounting firms. And uh, I didn't know at the time. Anyway, he, um, he, I went back to see him and he got me the job where I, I wound up being after I left uh, Hartley Point. I was three weeks out of work and I then went for a work for a company called Westfy. And my job was looking after two little companies at the time. One was called Dino, Dino Industries in Bunbury. That was a, um, a company that manufactured resins that went into making particle board. And the other one was a small little timber company called West Pine Industries. And I started there in 93. And uh, in 2000, I started there when you West... You retired from there, didn't you? No, no. no? Yeah, I did, I did retire from there. I, I'll just tell you this, then, then I'll uh, go back and tell you my Christian story. Yeah. And I went, well, looked up, I joined West Pine on uh, 7th of May 1993. Uh, and in 2000, they, West Pine had gotten so big, they had to spend a lot of money. Under the Regional Forest Agreement in WA, they cut out all the hardwood for housing construction. They were growing pine. Yeah. And so West Pine was a joint venture between uh, West, Fire, West Australian Forest Industries and Bunnings. Then Bunnings were taken over by West Farmers. And in 2000, Westfi sold out to a company called um, um, CVC Joint Venture Partners, which was a uh, Citibank's uh, venture capital company around the world. And they were, what they were doing is buying up small... Westfi was a particle board manufacturer or, or MDF board manufacturer. They were buying companies up like that around Australia and putting them together and selling them on. And a year later, they sold it to uh, Fletcher Building from New Zealand. So Fletcher Building is a mini West Farmers. And they still own 50% today through their Laminex subsidiary, and West Farmers still owns 50% of West Pine. 
Yeah. But I was there for 22 and a half years. We went from turning over about 77,000 cubes of logs up to 500,000, and we spent about $120 million over the time, up until about 2012, a lot of money was spent. And uh, it was a very, I, I used to do everything. I was company secretary, I was finance controller, financial general manager, admin and finance. I did the tax returns, I looked after all the payrolls, I attended the board meetings as company secretary, I looked at insurances, and I did the whole lot. I'll come back to how I managed all that and had one other accountant who helped me. Wow. And it was really good. And I retired from there on the 23rd of December 2015. Amazing. And I've been at home duties ever since. Happily, <laughs> happily, <laughs> yeah. home duties. But, so how did you become a Christian? Well, it goes back to Helen. Um, in 1981, uh, when our daughter Jennifer was born in 80, Helen had um, some, uh, like a, uh, what do you call it false pregnancy, false labour pains about a month before Jennifer was born and she went up in King Edward Memorial Hospital. And when we were in there, uh, I was visiting Helen and Helen said to me, I know that lady over there. And uh, turned out that her name was uh, Mary, she married names Mary Edwards. When Helen came out in the first time, was it? In the first time in 64, she'd met her at North Beach Primary School. And unbeknown to us, Mary was a Christian and her husband Cyril. And so um, in 1981, Mary led Helen to the Lord. Wow. And uh, then there was, there was a group of seven ladies got together and prayed me into the kingdom. And believe me, they prayed me into the kingdom. <laughs> and I used to go along to all the things. And uh, one of the funny stories is uh, Scripture Union we used to be in Sherwood Court down Perth. Yes. And I used to pull up out the front in the car and say, pull up there and say to Helen, okay, you've got 10 minutes to go inside there and have a look at any books. And I'd wait in the car. 10 minutes in a Christian bookshop. We've got hundreds of books at homes now. Anyway, yeah. uh, for seven years I just didn't, didn't connect. Didn't connect, and we're only talking today or coming down tonight. Helen said to me, uh, she remember asking me, and after I became a Christian, didn't I ever see anything that uh, different in her? And I said, no. I said, Satan had his hands over my eyes and fingers in my ear. I didn't yeah. see anything. Anyway, uh, one of the group's uh, husband died and had a uh, funeral service at Shiloh and uh, just up at Girraween. And uh, her name was Debbie and uh, Graham. And uh, Graham passed away playing basketball. He left three young girls. Mm -hmm. And when I went along there, I was just so taken how Debbie was so calm. Yeah. You know, just this was in, I think it was September, I think it was, something like that. And uh, September 88. And, um, and so I said, Helen, look, We'd been meeting Cyril and Mary for a, a long time and going up to their place at Quinns Rock. And if you want to know anything about the Old Testament, you talk to Cyril. He <laughs> is an absolute guru on it and he studies it and everything like that. He's just a really top bloke. We used to go up there and have big debates about it. James Goss is a good friend of Cyril's. Okay. And um, anyway, uh, we went up speaking and Helen said to me, we want to go and see Cyril. So I used to go over once a week over to Cyril's place. And Helen even bought me a book before this, was uh, how, to, how to Give Away Your Faith. And I used to say to Helen, look, I'm a logical person. If I can touch Jesus, then I'll believe in him. Yeah. That's what I used to say to her. Thomas. Yeah, probably. And uh, anyway, um, Cyril just took me through the gospel and he took me through the, you know, the, um, the chasm where yeah. sin separates you from God yeah. and the only way across was a cross and you had to take a step of faith. And on the 21st of November, 1988, I gave my life to the Lord. Beautiful. And I come home and we were in the, Helen's mum and dad had joined us from England and they were in our current bedroom and we were in the big back bedroom and Helen was in bed when I got home about 10.30 at night. She said, oh, did anything happen tonight? I said, yeah, I gave my life to the Lord. Good night. <laughs> now, after seven years of waiting for me, that's what I said to her. And then she wouldn't let you go to bed. <laughs> I think she did. She shot me. <laughs> but she always had this fantasy that she would be at church one day and they'd do an altar call and, and I'd come walking be, yeah, in, you know. Crying and getting yeah. on your knees. But it was nothing like that. It was all about a step of faith. And I can honestly say uh, from then on, I have never looked back. Mm. Uh, the Lord just took me. Proper I, conversion. Yeah, it was a proper conversion. I, uh, 21st of November, in January, uh, we were building the extension of our place for mum and dad. And a friend of ours, I was in the Lions organisation, 
friend of the lives of the brick may come over and um, he said, uh, you know, he was building the extension and I said to Helen, I'm just going to go up to the liquor store and buy half a dozen cans of beer and I'll have a beer with Kim. And 26 of January 1999, about 5.30 in the afternoon, I come inside to Helen and I said, that didn't taste right, I'll give it up for a while. Yeah. Never touched it since. Wow. Just that, that was a miracle in itself, I reckon. It's God. Oh, well, it's my family were all alcoholics. I'll go back to my brother Stephen in a minute, but my dad was an alcoholic and uh, he went up, uh, he gave it all up, but he had, dement had sort of a dementia. Uh, my mum never touched it, mm. but all my brothers drank like a fish anyway. Uh, some of them are giving it up now. But uh, anyway, uh, in uh, February 1989, I was baptised and uh, went, I went to the pastor at the what Winter, church? Where Winter were Church of Christ. Okay. It was the only brand new building that had been opened at Mullaloo. Nice. Helen used to meet there at, when they were um, at a little tin shed on uh, Bridgewater Drive and then where Spotlight is at Whitford's. And then they bought the Mullaloo Shopping Centre that went bankrupt. They yeah. bought that. And uh, then they sold it and used the money to build the existing church over there. I yeah, went up to the pastor it's about a good it. business there. Yeah. I went up to the pastor and I said, look, I used to be in the lines and helping people. I'm a trained accountant. Can I help? Well, I was on the board. I was put on the investment committee. I yes. was on the board of the church. Mm -hmm. Brand new Christian, I might yeah. add. Yep. I was on the missions committee. Oh, oh missionary. <laughs> I was on the missions committee. And uh, we were on all sorts of welcome rosters and all this. And really, I just got burnt out. <laughs> and we were there for se seven years. I think it was seven years, was it? Don't know. No, oh, anyway, uh, I'm sure it was seven years, and I just, I just had to give it up. Then. Yeah, I, but I had to give it up because I just couldn't do it all. And what the pastor should have said to me was, "Your wife's been waiting for you for seven years. You go away and find out what it's like to be a good Christian husband, and come back and see me yeah, when, when, you, you're, when ready. you're ready." And he never did that. No, he just plugged me in. Plugged me in, and I was running around it. everywhere. But the, the as chairman of the missions committee, like. Come on, I believe the missions were like Robert Morley, an African queen, you know? Yeah. The white suit in the middle of Africa with the turned up collar and the hat. That's what I believe they were. But I soon learned that they were real people and doing a real good job for, for God. And we used to support lots of people, got a lot of stories from them. One weekend we had a Faith Promise weekend. And I remember speaking to the technicians at Swan Cement when I was there, and they got me a digital clock, yep. a, a, a counter. And uh, I found out from some statistics how many people went to uh, went to hell every every minute. Yes. And I had this program middle of the clock. When we had our missions weekend, I turned it on. Yeah. At the end of the weekend, it was, I can't remember how many had counted, but one guy came up to me and said, "Oh, he said I'm devastated. I didn't realise that they'd you know they'd lost you know so, so many, many people, and that really you know spoke to me. And uh, at that time, God gave me a, a, a real good vision about uh, what Christianity is all about. It's like a wave. You get yeah. a wave coming into a series of rocks. You get all the evangelists, i.e. Nathaniel, <laughs> uh, coming in, they'll run into the rock, keep on yeah. running into the rock. But you've got the body behind you yeah. that supports those people and then yeah. you've got the other people behind that are just getting pulled on by the tide. Mm. So he gave me that just to say that it's a body that we've got to look after, not just one, you can't just do one thing. Anyway, after seven years, we uh, left there and we joined Church and Christian Fellowship. Ah. And we were there, we joined in 95. And we were there for about 22 years. And you ended up on the board oh, yeah, and in yeah. accounting. Yeah, and... being in accounting. <laughs> I, I was there and I saw the pastor there, John McElroy, and again said I was an accountant. Could I help? Then I was on the um, – they decided to buy the building. They bought that building in uh, 2000, it was. And uh, I was put on the um, fundraising committee yeah. and looking after all the books, which I did for – you know, for the you know, we got the deposit together and we uh, wound up buying the building and then uh, – about a year or so later, he decided to invite me onto the board of the church. Beautiful. And I was on the board for about 10 or 11 years, I think it was. And uh, then the treasurer left. And so being the accountant, I was the treasurer as well. Naturally. Oh, naturally. And at that time, Helen was working in the community services, it was called. or uh, It started out as compassion ministry, but it was community services. The uh, guy who ran it was a um, full-time chef. Yeah. Or it was a, sorry, fully trained chef. I know him. Uh, Hannes Tischhauser. Yeah, Canadian. Yeah, no, he's, he's Swiss. Swiss, but he lives in Canada. Yes, he lives in Canada. Yeah. Uh, he started uh, Churchland's Kitchen yeah. with a one-pot burner making up soup. And uh, we had a grant from the Lotteries Commission, and they went up building a kitchen at uh, Churchland's uh, worth $200,000. Yeah. And Hannes run that. And they used to feed about 120, 130 people every Wednesday. Yes. And uh, support all the schools in the northern area. They had... Uh, 
The government changed the laws about using food that was no longer good in the supermarkets that would spot some whatever. And so Hannes somehow convinced them to give him two vans. He has to go around and pick up all this food and give it away in hampers and supply schools with breakfasts and I know. all Beautiful. this sort of stuff. It was amazing. Yeah. Anyway, um, Helen... Um, that's where I met you, met Helen, at Churchlands. Oh, yeah, that's right. I remember Nathaniel coming on board in Churchlands. I was on the board and... Uh, I even remember writing a note to John McElroy saying that uh, he'd, I don't know how long John had known you. Yeah. And I wrote, as been a board member, I said, we may, perhaps we should give Nathaniel a trial for a while because uh -huh. we'd, had, we'd had other people yes. there who uh, you know, turned up and they just hadn't worked out. Of course. And anyway, uh, John had his way and he, um, Nathaniel was appointed and uh, I got to know Nathaniel there and... Uh, Went up to start doing his books for him there when he first That's started right. out at ASOM. And from then on, we do all the different ones now. <laughs> now, now we've got so many entities. Yeah. And oh, it's all right. They're easy, easy, easy to do. They cross reference. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, uh, we were there for a long time there. Then um, I can't remember what was it, 2000, see, four and a half years now. So it'd be 2018, 2017. 2017, some things went on at Jertsons that we, we, uh, decided to take a break from in May. We took the month of June off, and in that time, Helen's mum, uh, who was living with us, mum and dad lived with us from uh, 30 years, Helen, wasn't it? Um, in that granny flat was built on. And um, Helen's mum was uh, finally, she could hardly walk, could look after herself, because dad had passed away in 2013. And um, mum, I was living there and she was coming into us for, you know, all the meals. And Helen was just, you know, the chauffeur, appointment keeper, yep. you know, everything. And mum uh, went up in hospital in early July and then come home for about eight days and Helen tried to look after her but couldn't. And mum made a decision that she was going to go back into hospital and go into care. Yes. And so we took some more time off. We took another six months off from Churchlands. And... Um, we went up through our friend Fred Boschart. Yes. Uh, he pointed us on to Juniper at uh, board. And we, funnily enough, when we filled out, I fired a shotgun approach, filling out all the forms for mum. Uh, a lady at the um, uh, Juniper at Belcatta uh, knew, knew us. So uh, was no, Fred couldn't say, put these people on, but he just said, these are good people. And mum was in uh, a place over at Ascot, uh, Regis, uh, Aegis at Ascot which was a transition house, mm -hmm. and they had, unfortunately, because of the nature of it, they had all different uh, disabilities in there, you know, like yeah. uh, abilities in there. And mum was in a room sharing with two people with dementia, which was, oh, oh, was terrible. not helpful. Anyway, she was only there for 12 days when the average stay in there was um, seven weeks. Anyway, we uh, took a place at Balcatta, and mum moved into Balcatta, and she stayed there until they moved over to Crystal Halliday near Karanup, and she passed away in February last year. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so mum, mum and dad lived with us and uh, in next door and it was just like a separate apartment, separate units, whatever, gave them the big back bedroom and another bedroom, was another one bedroom unit was sort of built on. Anyway, in that time, uh, while we were uh, looking after mum and settling her in, only one or two people from Churchlands ever contacted us and saw how, see how we were. So we decided uh, after a bit of a you know, break, we'd look around for a church close to home. Yeah. And uh, I'd been driving up to Joondalup, you know, uh, living up there since 86, uh, driving around Winton Road quite a lot. And there were six churches on Winton Road. And then we yeah. went down from Hodges Drive by the bus depot and turned right. There was yeah. a, a little church in the old milk uh, depot, which is no longer there now. It's an, an international education uh, uh, head office. Right next door was Global Heart. Then around the corner there was, you know, four other churches. And I said to Helen, let's go here. Yeah. We've been driving past here, so we went into Global Heart in February 18, and we were made so welcome there. It was just yeah. an amazing place. We felt like home. Mm. And uh, we said we'd give them, I think it was six weeks in each place, and to make our mind up, well, we haven't moved from there. Praise God. And, and, and you're involved there with yeah. uh, First Steps? Yeah, what happens in Global Heart is that those days, uh, when you first join, if you aren't a Christian, if you are a Christian, you go through what they used to call their ID track, which is now called Next Steps. But if you're a new Christian, you go through what's called First Steps. Yeah. And the, the pastor who's now the location pastor in Melbourne, Eli McGregor, he invited us to come along and just be observant. So yes. unbeknown to us, he was checking us out as well. <laughs> and 
you know, we, um, after he invited us then to join the team and uh, it was about July, June or July 18, something like August, was it? So he's got a better memory than me. Uh, and we've been on the team then and it was an absolute pleasure to be able to go and disciple people, uh, anybody new to uh, Christ, to take them through a series of four lessons or new to church yeah. to take them through another four lessons. And then you kept in touch with them after a while and because uh, I'm a retired old bloke, um, I look after adults over 35 and Helen looks after yeah. adult women over 35. And we've been, in, been doing that since then. And about a couple of years ago now, I joined a men's connect group. Again, wow. a lot of retired old blokes go meeting at church every Wednesday. Nice. And uh, there's, about, there's about 15 on our books, but there's about eight to 10 of us that turn up every time. Beautiful. And uh, about three or four months ago, the 2IC to it, uh, he left, and I've been asked to sort of be the 2IC to the group. Ah. So I now involve. Just can't help. Oh, no. I, well, I've got, you know, what am I going to do on a Wednesday? <laughs> we go along, we watch. So, Merv, video. what's next for you? Oh, it really, is, um, it really is up to God what's next for me. Um, we want to make sure that nothing is, uh, we don't do anything out of God's will. Yeah, uh, and w what he decides us to do, we're just not going to go. We've seen too many cases yep. where people have um, done things they think in their own strength and it's just failed. What would you like your grandkids to remember you by? Oh, when they think question. of grandpa, uh, probably a uh, bit of a silly old bloke. I get out on my hands and knees and bark like a dog and play with my grandkids. I was doing that today. I got two beautiful grandkids. A boy is nine in July, and Kelsey's uh, eight, fourteen months old. And it's just a joy to be with them. And uh, hopefully one day I will write my story because I've got a lot of other things I left out. Um, and so that they know it, I'm doing it in pictures. I've got a lot of photographs I take. I think I've got a database of about 90 to 100,000 photographs at home. It'll take you three years just to sort through. No, no, no. They're all sorted through. There's only no. one lot. There's about 8,000 that I'm sorting out. All the others are filed in date order, event, the whole lot. I've got a whole wow. filing system for them. That's amazing. Uh, uh, and so, yeah, you know, my, uh, well, hopefully we pray for our, our uh, family. Our, both our daughters gave uh, their lives to the Lord at a very early age, were involved in the youth group. Uh, but when they became adults, they've uh, been away. Uh, yeah. We're just praying for them to come back. Uh, yeah. They're both married. And um, uh, our eldest girl, Samantha, has been married, uh, I think it's six years this year. Mm -hmm. See, you got gotcha. you. I think it was five years last year. Uh, but she and she's got Kelsey, and she had a lot of trouble. She's a miracle baby, and uh, Jennifer is married to Jared. She's been married to him since two thousand and eleven, so it's eleven years. And uh, she's got a the beautiful boy Amari, and uh, we just love our girls. And love our, you know, one of them lives in Calaver, and one lives in Padbury, and we live in Heathridge. Just so we're about yeah, it's just ten minutes away. Well, our, our next stage in life is uh, probably downsizing because our house is too big just for us. But with the current market, we're not going to do it. We'll wait wait a while. But I want to go back to my brother Stephen. My brother Stephen was a uh, an alcoholic. He married a lady, and they used to drink a quart of Jack Daniels before lunch every day. Ouch! And he was How a could they afford it. Uh, he used to work. He was a very good uh, in the building industry as an estimator. But after a while, he was just on the dole. Yeah. And um, he used to smoke like a train too. So he was diagnosed with bowel cancer and you know all that sort of stuff and. He used to ring me up. He was uh, always half drunk when he rang me up. Anyway, uh, I think it's three years this year. I think it's three years ago this year. He was moved into care at a place called White Rock outside of Cairns. Yes. And the Lord laid on my heart to try and tell him about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And every time I rang him up, he couldn't hear me. And one day I, I just persisted. I went out the front of the house and walking up and down our path and it took me seven times to get through. And then I eventually led him to the Lord. A week wow. later, he died. And after that, I was talking to my brother Colin, and yes. he, Stephen was deaf. Yeah. So the Lord opened his ears just to hear it. <laughs> just to so hear it. So just amazing, yeah. So that was one good miracle. The other good miracle for me was as an apprentice, as a second-year apprentice, I went to a training workshop, and I was learning how to use a hammer and chisel, and I smashed my hand up. Ouch. Kept on hitting it with a hammer. I had bone chips in there and everything. I had three operations on it, and I used to call it my $6 million hand. <laughs> and um, nothing would, about 35 years, I had terrible pains in my hand, 
And in 73, six months after we got married, we had a bad car accident in Sydney. Oh. And uh, we we're going across the spit bridge and a guy crossed the centre line and I hit the side of the MGB and I got smashed in the head and Helen fortunately just dozed off to sleep and she never got hurt. Um, and I got pretty badly smashed up in the face and uh, I had a bad whiplash and I had terrible pains in my neck from 73 until 2003. Ouch. And I was at a board meeting at John McElroy's place in Sorrento. Yep. And... Uh, after the meeting, I said I'd gone through my degree, all that sort of stuff of terrible pains in the neck, my hand. I couldn't play golf, couldn't do anything. I used to go different colours. Anyway, this night I was prayed for at the board meeting. They anointed me with oil. I still don't know how I got home from that, from Sorrento to our yeah. place in Heathridge. And about yeah, there was the next night, a night later or something, we were at church and sitting up the back, and it was a, a training night, and I had terrible pains in this hand. And I'm sure it was, oh, it has to be the Lord. He just said to me, pray. And I just said, uh, if, if I've, been not, I've been healed by Jesus Christ, if that, that's the case, pain can't exist in this body. That's right. So in the name of Jesus, be gone. I've never been had pain since. Never had been. pain since, not in my neck, my hand. I can do anything. I can paint, dig, carpentry, anything. Hallelujah. And, it was, and it's, it's brilliant. It's really brilliant. Nothing whatsoever. Praise God. So he, healed, he decided to heal me. Praise God. And... One of the things I like doing in our starting point area is um, I love studying the Bible. Yes. I love studying the Bible. I got so many statistics in my head about how the Bible was, um, you know, the authenticity of the Bible. You know, when you think about the old Dead Sea Scrolls, when they were first uh, discovered, they checked up one passage in Isaiah and there was only 157 different words and there was only 11, it was 18 different uh, uh, words that were different from the Dead Sea Scrolls to the earliest record they had, and 11 of them were spelling errors, and the other ones were just interpretations. Wow. 95% accurate that the Dead Sea Scrolls That's are. Powerful. Yeah, and they've gone back, I think it's gone back 900 years from the earliest manuscript to now. They've got a com almost a complete manuscript of the Old Testament. Beautiful. I love that, and the New Testament, all done within a, within um, basically 60-odd uh, years of when Christ was on, yeah. on earth, and... Uh, all the, all the manuscripts that are out there, I've got so many things on my iPad, on my phone, and you know, Bibles. <laughs> the cloud and, that he oh, does, got, stars. And, yeah, uh, <laughs> no, I've got, got everything. I really have. No, not in the cloud. I don't store anything on the cloud. It's all at home. But I've got so many you know, books and that on there. And now they studied a, they started a series of night colleges at uh, Global Heart where they study different parts of the, the Bible. And the next one coming up on the 26th of July is going to be Genesis. Going. So I'm going along to do that over six weeks. Thank you so, so much for, for sharing yeah. these beautiful stories Thank in your you. heart for the kingdom yeah. of God and the gospel. Oh, I think it's yeah. absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Well, he's, a, he's, an amazing, he's an amazing God, and I thank him every day for each day that he gives me to wake up beside my, my wife and for my family and for everybody. Amazing story. Yeah. Well, folks, uh, you've heard an amazing story from Merv. The Lord, uh, yes, allowed him to go many, many ways and uh, saved his life, you know, Absolutely. <laughs> over 20 times just yep. on that journey from, uh, from America to, to the Middle East and then into the South Pacific. We just um, can't help it but see God's grace throughout Absolutely. his life. So praise yep. God for that. I'm sure that this story encourages you to carry on the good work and not to give up, especially on your family. That's right. Like Merv didn't give up on his brother but went to yes, see sir. him while he was in palliative care and lead him to the Lord. Mm. There's always something we can do while somebody's Absolutely. still alive. So praise God for that. Yep. We pray that you're encouraged and built up and uh, share this amazing story with others so others can experience the same uh, encouragement. We look forward to seeing you next time here at Kingdom Stories from Down Under. My name is Nathaniel. Thank you for joining us on Kingdom Stories from Down Under. We'd love it if you would subscribe, rate, and share these stories with your wider community. And remember, every story is worth sharing, including yours.